Good morning. My name is Jamie. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Suburban. And uh, like Jerome was praying, our elders are gone uh, on their retreat. I had somebody at the first service ask me, uh, when they let you preach, do you get nervous? And my response in my head, I don't say it out loud, is they turned on the microphone and they, they left town. I guess my, my real question is, aren't you nervous? <laughs> Just a, a, a moment of honesty. How many of you guys think this is the 930 service? Okay, I feel like I have to believe you. I'm not sure that I do, but I feel like I'm supposed to. So August 5th of 2004 was a a day that changed my life forever. It wasn't the day that my hair started falling out, although it might be connected. August 5th of 2004 is actually the day that I adopted this kid. It's the day that God brought my son home. He was three years old when I met him. His first words to me were, are you my new daddy? I lost it. I know I talk about it a lot, but you got to admit, he's pretty great. People used to think we look alike. Now he gets upset when people say it. (laughs) It was uh, March 25th of 2007 that we adopted his sister, and um, she came to live with us. That's the day she moved in. And she's as honorary as she looks. I I am blessed. I know what you're thinking, pretty great. And you're right, she's pretty great. Uh, this is what they look like today. My son that was three now is as tall as I am. He can grow a better mustache than I do. And I'm gonna pick on him a little bit today and he's okay with that because he gets five bucks every time I use him in a sermon. So it's 15 bucks today, better be worth it. <laughs> you know, I feel like what I have with Corey is pretty rare. He's a good kid. I love him a lot. And we we really enjoy spending time together and we can talk about just just about anything. And the funny thing is, is we're not even into the same things really. I mean, he likes to read for crying out loud. (laughs) And he likes video games and I used to play video games with him. Now that I can't win, I don't play. (laughs) But the truth is we have this really special relationship and I love it. I love that God has has blessed me with this kid. I mean, he's everything that I'm not, but yet we still have this really cool friendship, this really cool relationship. And and the reason why I bring that up is because of a mistake I made in my youth ministry years. I spent 20 years in youth ministry, stepped out of youth ministry about two years ago. And um, I feel silly every time I say this, like when I hear it out loud, it's like, man, what were you thinking? Um, But I used to teach parents that it wasn't their job to be friends with their kids. I don't want to be honest, I I knew what I meant when I said it, and I totally agree with what I meant. (laughs) And I think that there is an ounce of wisdom. It might be less than that. I mean, what I was trying to say is that, you know, I I think there are times and situations where we as parents, sometimes we want to be friends with our kids to the point where we appease their every whim, and that's not our job. In fact, I think what I've realized is it comes down to really how we want to define this word friendship. Friendship. As a parent, we need to be the authority figure. We need to be a provider, an example, a leader, the one who gives and teaches discipline. It's our job to to train up our kids in the way that they should go. We need to know when to push and when to listen, when to help and when uh, when to allow struggle to be the teacher. But the truth is, I've learned that in all of this, that it all gets really fuzzy. It all gets really fuzzy outside the context of a genuine concern, real conversation, and the walking through life together that I would define as friendship. My kids know my grumpy look for sure. They know that I I will not withhold discipline. They know that I'm willing to confront when I feel like that's what's needed. But I want my kids to know that I desperately want to be close to them every day of their life. I want them to know that they have a dad that they can talk to about anything. I want them to know that I I care about them. I, I want them to know that they can trust me. I want them to know that I have their best interest at heart, even if that means picking a fight every now and then. Although he's getting big, I need some help. I want them to know that they're cared for and respected. And while 
Well, friend, it's not the only way that I relate to my kids. It's not the only role that I play with my kids. I, I, to be honest, it's my favorite. It's my favorite. And I think it gives context to every other role that I play with them. And here's the interesting thing. As much as it blows my mind and as hard as it is is for me to understand, the Bible teaches that God wants a very similar relationship with you and I. I'm going to read a lot. uh, And I've struggled reading all day today. I don't know what's going on. It's a time change. That's what it has to be. I know how to read. I will prove it. Um, But I'm going to read uh, 16 verses. We're going to be in John 15, 1 through 16. And uh, this is what it says. Man, there's all this pressure now. Okay. This is what it says. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they'll produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot, you cannot be uh, fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a a pile to be burnt. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. You remain in my love, and when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And this is is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I've loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You are my friends since I have told you everything the fathers told me. And you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Let's pray. God, we don't want to be the kind of people that comes to your word and walks away missing it. So give us ears to hear and eyes to see. God, give us the courage to understand what it is that you have for us and to live it out every day in our life. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. The three things that I want to talk about, the first one is that God wants to be close to you. We are meant to be close to God, connected to him. And you you can't search the scripture and come to any other conclusion. God desires to be close to you. And you can see it in the way that he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, and you can read all about it in the, in the closing chapters, the closing verses of, of Revelation when it talks about what waits for those who take God up on his invitation for closeness. God wants to be close, and, and you can read all through Scripture. First Peter 5 says that God invites you to cast all of your cares upon him because of how much he cares for you. And Philippians 4, he tells you not to worry about anything, but you can pray about everything. He invites you to come to him with everything. Psalms 145 says that God is near to those who call out to him. Jeremiah 23 says that God is not far off at all, but that he's always near. And Matthew 11 says that you can go to him when you're weary and that he'll give you rest. Revelation 3 points, uh, paints a picture of God standing at the door of your heart and knocking, desiring uh, for you to let him in so that he can come in and have fellowship with you, friendship with you. And Jeremiah 31 says that God has drawn you to him. God God has drawn you to himself with an everlasting love. God desires to be close to you, to be connected with you. It's a common theme throughout Scripture. John 15, it's it's interesting. John 15 uses a a, a bunch of different words, depending on translation that you use, uh, and it's all really the same Greek word in the original language. Uh, John 15 tells us to live in him, to remain in him, to uh, abide in him. And it's important that we note that this word abide, if you were to go through and and underline every time that word is used in these 16 verses, you're going to find out that it's used 11 times. Jesus uh, uses the word abide 11 times in this passage. It seems like he's trying to help us catch on to something here, something that's really important to him. Abide means to dwell, 
to stay, to remain, to make our home in. And verse 5 says that we abide in him and that he abides in us. We remain, we dwell, we make our home in him, and he makes his home in us. It's a picture of closeness that God desires with each and every one of us. Verse 14 to 15 takes it, in my opinion, a little step further. Jesus uses the term friends. And we just finished doing this study, right? The uh, prayer begins with a relationship. And really, uh, the book that we studied as a church has to do with uh, this, the author. Her name is Cynthia Bezik. And, and she felt off. She felt like this relationship with God that she read about in Scripture was something that she just wasn't experiencing. She felt like she was lacking, like she was empty. And yeah, she read her Bible. She prayed. She went to church. She served. She did those things that we think that people are supposed to do if they're going to feel close to God. But it wasn't until she came, uh, came to grips or began to come to grips with the biblical concept of God's desire for friendship with her that she began to experience this connectedness that we're talking about today. You know, we got some feedback from that study, and I, I solicited it. I, I wanted to hear it. And it was interesting to know that, that many of us struggle with this idea of friendship with God. That was a struggle for some of us. It's almost like we, we prefer or that it's easier for us to understand him as, as God, as Lord, as master, as teacher. But for some reason, it seems like there's a lot of us that want to take a step back when it gets to this issue of friendship with him. And it reminds me of what we read in John chapter 13, right? You, you, um, that's the passage when, when Jesus is washing his disciples' feet and he's going down the line and he gets to the, the same guy that Neil was talking about earlier. He gets to Peter and what was Peter's reaction? He freaked out. If you really kind of get to the bottom of what Peter told Jesus, he said, Jesus, you will never play that role in my life. I mean, washing, washing feet was a role that was kind of ascribed to the lowest of the low in terms of the servant ranking. And that's the, the role that Jesus was trying to play. Peter said, you will never play that role in my life. And think about what Peter would have missed, what he would have missed if he would have persisted to deny Jesus in that way. I mean, eventually Jesus had his way and he washed uh, Peter's feet. But think about what Peter would have missed if he persisted to deny Jesus in that way. Not allowing Jesus to teach him about service. Not allowing him to teach about leadership and about friendship. And I hope that we all know, I mean, this, this is certainly true in my life, and I think it's kind of, I hope, it's, I hope we're all on the same page with this, that it's, it's okay to struggle. We know that, right? That sometimes when we, when we come across things like, uh, friendship with God is a biblical concept, and when we come across these things like friendship with God and, and, and we struggle, it's okay, right? We know that it's okay. It's okay to struggle. In fact, it was through the struggle that, that the author of the book found a deeper relationship with God. I, I think that God often works in the midst of struggle. I have a good friend uh, who he and his wife are really going through a struggle, and just yesterday I read something that he wrote. I think it said something to the effect of that he felt like tragedy was the true tutor of wisdom. The tragedy was the true tutor of wisdom. I think struggle is too. God often works in the midst of the struggle, so look for him there. I think it's important for us to know that friendship with God doesn't diminish the other ways that we come to know and relate to him. And we still know him as God, as Lord, as Master. It doesn't change the way that we approach his majesty. It doesn't change the way that we should hear his authority with quick ears and quick feet. His friendship doesn't somehow, your, your friendship with him doesn't somehow make him less. God's friendship with you doesn't somehow make him less. It doesn't wipe away these other important ways that we know and relate to God. I also think it's important for us to realize that we come, we come to this friendship at his invitation. We come to this friendship at his invitation. Verse 16 says that, that we didn't choose him, that he chose us. I think it's important for us to know that we're not invading God's holy space. That we're not stepping on the creator's toes that we're somehow not fighting his will. In fact, we're honoring the request of the king. We're giving the father exactly what he wants with his kids. And imagine how your prayer life would, would be different. I mean, talking to God like you would talk with your best friend. Remembering that God is for you. 
that God is for you. And we don't go simply asking for intervention, protection, and provision, but, but we walk in this close relationship with God, with this connectedness, with our eyes fixed on him, with our minds set on him, constantly aware of his, of his presence in our life. God desires closeness with you. God desires closeness with you. And how we approach him, how we relate to him is critical. And one of the ways that God wants to relate to you is his friend. Don't deny him. The second thing that I want to talk about is that we're meant to be healthy. We're meant to be healthy. John 15, uh, 2 and 3 says that, that God cuts off every branch that doesn't bear fruit and that he prunes the ones that do so that they'll be even more fruitful. And Jesus says that those who reject God's invitation to be connected, those that reject God's invitation to be close, it says that they're cut off. And that's a hard truth for some of us personally. I think that it's a hard truth for all of us because of people that we know and love, if we understand what he's saying. Personally, I, I think an appropriate question, a really important question, right here to, 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 to look at and ask is, how do I know? How do I know? I mean, am I really connected to God? How do I know if I'm really connected to God? And John 15, I think, deals with that. Do you see it? Do you see what the distinguishing mark of his disciple is? Do you see what a distinguishing mark of someone who, who is connected and close to God is? Fruit is a distinguishing mark of someone who is connected to and close to Jesus. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. In my own quiet time, uh, this last week I read through Ezekiel and First and Second uh, Peter. And um, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, uh, this, is, this is what it says. This is in the message. It says, everything that, that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God, the best invitation we've ever received. I want to read it again. Everyone, or everything that goes into a life of pleasing God, so everything that goes into a life um, of pleasing God, right, has been miraculously given to us by the one who invited us to him, which is Jesus so basically what Peter is saying is you have everything that you need. When it comes to this idea of connecting with God and being close to God, you have everything that you need. That Jesus has provided all the tools, all the resources that we personally need to be connected to him, intimately to know him. And the only thing that gets in the way is us. This idea of pruning is directed at people who are, or who are connected to Jesus and who are bearing fruit. And it says that, basically what I hear Jesus saying is that being loosely affiliated isn't the goal here. Jesus' goal for you is not to have this kind of loose affiliation with who he is and, and, and what he's up to. Bearing minimal fruit, although it might be true for a time, it might be reality for a time, it's not the goal here. God desires us to be healthier, to be closer I think that's what this passage is saying. And being healthy requires cultivation. Being healthy requires cultivation. This idea of pruning, I think that's what it's talking about. And, and God will prune away disease in our life, those, those parts of us that are infected by sin. And sin is one of those things that causes distance in our relationship with God. It even affects the way that God uses us, which is an interesting thing, and it hurts my brain to think about that. This is what it says in 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. From the English Standard Version, it says this, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable, honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Useful to the master of the house and ready for every good work. Sin has the ability to slowly or, or even sometimes in massive fashion damage our desire. It can damage the way that we view God or view ourselves. It can cause distance in our relationship with him. And, and just to be clear, God desires to deal with sin in our life. It's the human condition. Everyone in this room struggles with it. There's no sense in, in pretending that it's not a reality. God desires to deal with sin and, and we, that's us. We struggle with sin. We all do. And he desires to deal with that. God also will prune away overcrowding. 
God will prune away overcrowding that leads to damage or less fruit. And this reminds me of the passage in Hebrews 12, right, where it says that we're supposed to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and that we're to run the race that God has set out for us. This idea of of throwing off everything that hinders. uh, Sometimes God's pruning means setting down things, sometimes even good things that slow us up and that keep us from what God has for us things that take our eyes off of where we're at and where we're headed that cause us to lose our appetite for greater things. I like to make lists of things, and i got to be honest, when it came to this idea of, of these things that we're supposed to throw off that hinder our relationship with God that may not in and of, them, in and of themselves be bad, and the list that I came up with was my list. It's all I could really think of. So I think about, you know, Facebook. I think about TV. Probably the hardest one for me is Sports. Not necessarily bad things. But sometimes the role that they play in my life keeps me from being as connected to God as I ought to be. They take my eyes off of where I'm at, cause me to lose my appetite for greater things, his things. I put reading down, but I crossed it off. I just want to be honest. I'd like that to be my problem, but not so much. Jesus tells us that we're pruned by God's word, by the message that he gave us. We're pruned by God's word. And God's word is crucial to the life of a believer. I think that the Bible encourages us to be in his word every day. God's word is where he reveals himself to us. It's where we read about who he is and what he's like and how he operates, how he thinks, what he desires for us, and what he expects from us. It's where we find his definition for things like truth and love and friendship and any other attempt, man-made attempt to redefine any of that stuff is counterfeit. There's no substitute for the word of God in your life. There is no substitute for the word of God in your life. There's no substitute for praying, communicating with God. And if that's something that you're not currently doing, I want to encourage you to start today. I mean, we all start somewhere. And I'll give you some advice on that. We, uh, at the Forge, the men's conference wasn't uh, this last Friday and Saturday, but a, a week ago. And D. Duke from Jefferson Baptist was here, and he encouraged our guys with something. It's the same stuff that I teach. If you to take, uh, we, we have a class. It's called Foundations and Growing. And it, I teach that class, and it's almost the same stuff that D teaches and when I first became a believer, I, I made a mistake. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't been, been spending any time with God. I didn't really know what I was doing. And, and so have you guys seen that thing like read the Bible in a year? That was my first attempt at spending time with God every day. And if you're super disciplined, I would say that might work for you. But for the rest of us, I want to tell you, I think it's a bad idea. Because typically, what, at least for me, what ends up happening is that I'll make it for a week if I'm doing real good. <laughs> but then I'll miss a day. And I feel defeated. Because there's no way that I'm going to be able to read everything to catch up to that point. And I want you to know that I don't think that feeling of defeat in your relationship with God is what he desires for you. In fact, I think it's exactly the opposite of what God desires for you. And so if you're not currently spending time in the Word, or if you're not as consistent as you feel like you ought to be, I would encourage you to consider this. Pick a day. Do it right now if you need to. What day works for you? What is the best day? And once you find that best day, pick a time. What's the best time for you? When are you most awake? When are you most alert? For some of us, if our schedule is just totally busy, I'm going to tell you, wake up five minutes early. It's really not that hard. We're talking five minutes. And give five minutes a day. Give give five minutes to God that day. And maybe some of us can start with a few days and and do that for a while and then add another day and then do that for a while and add another day. And, And when you get to the point where you're spending five minutes with God every day, You know, the jump between five and ten minutes really isn't that big. It's just ten minutes. God desires us to be connected with him. And if that's something that that you desire, if that's something that you want, I have some stuff that I brought with me today that I think can be helpful. I'd love to talk with you and pray with you about that. I think it's important. Um, I know that the time when I started trying, uh, and I I fail at this sometimes, just, you know, like I don't spend time in the word every day. That's my goal, and I fight for that, but I, I fall short. There are days that I miss. Um, but, the, but when I started to grow in my faith, and that was part of the commitment I made, was to spend time in the Word every day. And, and God used that in a profound way in my life to grow and to be connected to Him. And we read God's Word not to check it off of a list, not just to seek facts or thoughts or feelings or sentiment, 
but we approach God and his word as, as one of the ways that, that we try to, to reach out for his closeness, to connect with him, to draw near to him, listening, seeking, expecting to hear from, from him, and allowing his word to invade all that we are, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls, all that we are. Verse 14 says that Jesus' friends hear from him and, and that they do what he says. A while back, uh, Pastor Steve uh, preached on something similar, and, and he came up with a list, or uh, he found a list in a book that he was reading called uh, Guidelines for a Listening Prayer. And he made copies of them, and he put them on the information center out just outside these doors to the left, and they're there again today. I asked him to send those to me, and, and I printed them off, and, and they're out there. And so if that's something that you want to get, to these guidelines for listening prayer, I, I encourage you to do that. I mean, part of a friendship with God, part of this connection, this closeness with God, which is hard for some of us, is communication with God. That's hard for some of us. I'm going to be honest, it's hard for me. This idea, this concept of communication with God is hard for me. But search the scripture and you will find a God that communicates in a variety of ways with his people. Search the scripture and that's what you'll find. That God is a God who communicates with his people in a variety of ways. Through his word, through prayer, through through other believers, through dreams, through thoughts, through nudges and impressions. I mean, I've never personally heard the audible voice of God. If I did, I'd probably make a mess. That didn't sound right, sorry. Um, I'm just going to read my notes from now on. I really can't get out of that one. I've never heard the audible voice of God. But I do feel like God has communicated with me in very real and tangible ways. I could tell you stories about it. Things that give me chills to think about. Times where I feel like, you know, the the, the impression that God had put on my heart was undeniable. The third thing that I want to talk about is that we were meant to bear significant fruit. That we were meant to bear significant fruit. You know, the more I looked at this passage, the more that I wanted to pick on this idea of of the exact spot where the branch connects to the vine. And that seems to be like an important thing when I read this passage, the exact spot where the branch connects to the vine. And, And I started to see this as the conduit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The healthier that connection to Jesus is, the more freely his life is flowing in and through us. The more we we begin to reflect his nature, his love, his faithfulness, his goodness, and his self control. His very life flowing in us and through us. And I want to pick apart a little bit of of the idea of what fruit is. I mean, fruit is the result of this connection that we have with Jesus. Like a branch gets everything that it needs. It gets its nourishment from the vine. That's the role that Jesus and the Holy Spirit plays in us. I mean, what we need for life and for fruitfulness is poured out in in our lives right there at this point of connection. And the health of that connection is extremely important. In fact, I would tell you, I think it's the most important. An easy definition uh, for fruit, uh, at least for me, I think of what it says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Paul says that um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's definitely a part of it. I mean, the idea of of those are things that that God wants to see in our lives. Those are things that God wants to be prominent in our lives. And I would say that that he wants us to get to the point where those things are the reaction in our lives to everything that life throws at us. I'm not there yet. But I'll be honest and I'll say, you know, the more that I looked at this and the more that I studied this, I would tell you that's definitely part of it. I think there's more. I think there's more to it than that. I think it's Jesus' life being replicated in ours. His thoughts becoming ours, his purpose, his priorities. This passage in John 15 says even his joy becomes ours. His love begins to flow in us and through us and impacts the people around us in profound ways. We become agents of his truth, agents of his grace. We become kingdom men and women. And it's far less about what we do and far more about who we're connected to and how healthy that connection is and how we walk in view of that connection with him. Like I told you, I was, I was reading Ezekiel this last week, and, and if you read Ezekiel, the first 20, cha- it's actually the book of Ezekiel, but um, up to this point, I had gotten through the first 20 chapters, and I'm going to summarize them for you real quick. 
And not that you shouldn't go read them on your own, but this is basically Ezekiel 1 through Ezekiel 20, verse 40. Israel was sinning a lot. That's basically, that's my summary. Israel was struggling. And, and um, Ezekiel was God's man. I mean, God was speaking to the people of, Ezek- uh, through, uh, people of Israel through Ezekiel. And Ezekiel told people through God, he, uh, he you know, said, hey, your time of pruning, your time of massive pruning is coming. In fact, it's here on behalf of God, Ezekiel went to the people of Israel and he said, hey, God says that you are going to be taken captive, that people are going to come in, invading armies are going to come in, and they're going to take you away. And this is what it says in verse 41. This is what caught my attention. But when you come from capt- captivity, I will display my holiness in you as the nations watch. But when you come back from captivity, I will display my holiness in you as the nations watch. I think our connection with God accomplishes much of the same thing. Our friendship with God, our connectedness to God accomplishes much of the same thing. The life of Jesus in us on display for the nation, our city, our neighbors, our spouse, even our kids. Just to kind of close it out, I mean, I want you to know that God desires to be close to you and it's crazy for me to think about that the God who created all that there ever was, the God who split the sea, the God who walked on water, the God who created all that there ever was, he healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, he turned water into wine, he left heaven to come to earth, he died on the cross to deal with the sin, this distance that sin creates in our life between us and God. And he rose from the dead, defeating death. All of this. I mean, do you catch this? All of this. It's the message of the gospel was to be close to you. That's really what it's about. Not anything that we've done, not even our current situation can take that away. The only thing that gets in the way of our connectedness, our closeness with God is our own unwillingness. And all this happens at his invitation, this connectedness, this constant communication His life flowing in us, this closer than a brother kind of friendship comes at his invitation. And in my opinion, it's an invitation that demands a response. And so you know what? That's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to ask you to respond to that. It's just between you and him. And that that really is is the point of what I see in John chapter 15. God is asking you into this this closeness, this connectedness, this friendship. And I think it's an invitation that demands a response. And I'm going to give you just a few minutes in the quietness of your heart to deal with that. What is your response to God's invitation? I'm willing to bet that there are some of us today that feel a lot like the author of our book did. The truth is they've kind of been a Christian for a long time and they feel disconnected, unplugged, unfruitful. Here in a minute, our our worship team is gonna come out and we're gonna sing a song. And if if that defines you, if that's really where you're at, I wanna talk to you not to point my finger at you or anything like that. I care about you, I wanna pray with you and I want, I, I think I have some things that can help with that. There also might be some people here this morning that come and are interested in what it means to be connected to God for the very first time. And I'm going to tell you the same thing. If that describes who you are, I, I want to talk to you about that. I want to pray with you. I want to try to do my best to help you get started on the right foot so that this connection with God is something that's not aloof for you, that's not distant for you. Would you pray with me? Got a, it's hard to know but to say in, in some regard when it comes to this idea of being connected to you. God, that you invite us, the God who, who, who split the sea, who walked on water, who turned water into wine, that, that, that this invitation for closeness of connectedness with friendship is, it's hard to know exactly how to respond to that. And to be honest, it doesn't make sense to me. But God, that's what you ask for. That's what you call us to. That's what we were created for, is to be connected with you, to experience your life flowing in us and through us. God, impacting our lives in massive ways. God, I believe that this connectedness changes us. It changes everything about us. It changes the way that we view marriage. It changes the way that we raise our kids. God, help us not to deny you that. 
God, help, 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 help our unwillingness. God, if there's things in us that need to be moved, we pray that you would move them. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?